happening. Great, thank you. I'd like to call the meeting of the LASD Board of Trustees to order. A recording and our broadcast of this meeting is being made at the direction of the board and the recording and our broadcast may capture images and sounds of those attending the meeting. Now take roll call. Jessica Spicer. Here. Vladimir Ivanovich. Here. Brian Johnson. Here. Steve Taglio. Here. And I wish Holly Serke am here as well. Agenda approval. Would any board members like to make provide comment on the agenda? Nope. Then may I please have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Thank you, Vladimir. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, the motion to approve tonight's agenda was made by Vladimir and seconded by Jessica. Uh, take a vote, Steve? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Vladimir? Yes. Brian? Yes. I too vote yes. Motion passes unanimously. On to closed session report. No action was taken in closed session tonight. Superintendent's update, Mr. Baer. Yes, good evening. Uh, just a couple of items. Um, uh, keeping up to speed with what has been going on last Saturday. I know uh, Shelly and uh, Jessica were able to attend the joint Santa Rita and Almond ELAC meeting that was held at uh, Del Medio Park. Um, I see lots of staff on tonight. So thanks for the many of you who were there. It was a, it was a great meeting, uh, a relatively small number of parents, but they certainly got the personal touch as we, as we dug into the year and, and understood how um, this year has affected their students and taking some feedback on that. So um, it was um, just a great event. So I appreciate all the staff that, that came out. Um, uh, Sandra and I last week uh, presented at the Los Altos Rotary Club, uh, just a, a reprise of, of this school year and sharing with our community what uh, the amazing work that our uh, teachers and staff have done at the schools. Um, so they were uh, very eager to, to hear about that. And it was, um, it was a great response. I got some great follow-up uh, emails as well, thanking, uh, thanking us as a district for what we're doing for the students in our schools. And then um, lastly, we are, as you know, in process uh, with um, interviewing for the Santa Rita principal, the next Santa Rita principal. I see a number of Bobcats in attendance tonight. Um, but we are uh, on to the third round uh, this week, third and fourth rounds this week. Um, and we hope to be uh, narrowing that, that down uh, further and coming up with um, a finalist um, next beginning of next week in all likelihood. So we'll keep you posted on that and hope to have some news for you soon. That's it, Shelly. Thank you. We're gonna move on to the consent items. Would any board members like to provide comment on the consent items E1 through E4? Vladimir? <clears throat> yeah, um, E3, denial of inter-district transfer request. Um, a while back, I had uh, made some comments about the fact that we deny inter-district transfers. <clears throat> and um, I thought that there was going to be a, uh, a discussion at some point about whether we could continue to do that or not, or whether we should continue to do that or not. And I haven't seen it appear um, on a, a list of future <clears throat> items. So in a, a, a spirit of uh, stubbornness, I'm actually going to vote against the uh, uh, approval of the consent items. But other than that, I'm okay with them. So, Jeff, do I pull E3 off the? Oh, there's a couple. There's a couple of ways of doing that. You can take them as uh, in their entirety, and and if Vladimir would like to vote no on them um, all, he can do that, or he can't. He could uh, ask for that one to be pulled and voted on separately. 
I'm, I'm okay with just doing it all, all at once. All at once? Okay. Um, any other comments? Okay. Then may I please have a motion to approve consent items E1 through E4? So moved. Thank you, Jessica. May I have a second, please? Second. Thank you, Brian. A uh, motion to approve consent items E1 through E4 was made by Jessica and seconded by Brian. Do a roll call vote. Steve? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Vladimir? No. Brian? Yes. I, too, vote yes. Motion passes. Uh, four yeses, one no. OK. On to uh, employee requests to address the board. From Los Altos Teachers Association, Kaylee Salyers. Good evening, LASD board members. I am Kaylee Salyers, newly elected vice president for the Los Altos Teacher Association. Tonight, I will be giving the LATA updates. We are winding down our school year, administering assessments and preparing for report cards as the 2021 end of year approaches. Considering the pandemic safety measures we have adhered to each trimester, we will not be having an open house. Although what we can showcase in each school is that our students continually persevere through these wild times. The teachers of LASD noticed that students showed notable resiliency, creativeness, and enthusiasm to be on our campuses learning and moving forward from the challenges put in place during the pandemic. We're not only proud of the students, but of all the teachers, staff, and administration in this incredible community. LATA would like to conclude their report this evening by expressing their gratitude for the Los Altos School District board members for their support during what I hope not to say next year, but here goes, unprecedented times. <laughs> Thanks, Kaylee. I hope that word unprecedented gets retired as well. Um, we do, from the California School Employees Association, I don't think we have anyone tonight, correct? Uh, you're on mute, Jeff. I'm not sure if Elena is uh, saying something. I see she's here. Elena? No hand up. It doesn't look like it. OK, great. Then we will move on. Uh, community comments. This time is reserved for citizens and employees to address the board on items that are not on the agenda. The board is not permitted to discuss or take action on non-agenda items, except to instruct the superintendent to review the matter further, report back to the board at a subsequent meeting, or place the matter on a future agenda. The board may make a brief comment or ask clarifying questions. Okay. So we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To do so, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app, or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Requests received after public comment begins will not be accepted. Let's give it a few seconds. Okay, seeing that there are no hands raised for uh, public comment, I'm gonna go ahead and close public comment and move on to our action slash discussion items. First up, school reopening update. Staff will provide an update on the current status of our school reopenings, COVID case rates, summer school, student vaccinations, and year-end events. Mr. Baer. Yes, good evening. Um, it's uh, strange to be presenting an agenda item called reopening update on uh, May 24th. Um, but everyone knows what it is, so we just kept the title. Um, contents have changed just a bit, though. Uh, next slide. Um, you've seen this chart all year uh, with regarding our positive cases. Um, we did have one positive case that required quarantining, or that is still requiring quarantining. Um, but again, our our case, our positive cases have been extremely low. And um, as, as Kaylee mentioned, uh, we have done uh, incredible work to, to ensure that our staff and our students are kept safe uh, on our campuses. So kudos to everyone involved with that. Next slide. 
Um, graduation and promotion. I sent uh, the board some information from each of the junior high schools um, as it has come out regarding uh, the, the promotion, uh, or I'm sorry, the graduation events that are gonna happen on Wednesday, June 9. Um, hopefully you can make each of those events, um, one at Los Altos, one at Mountain View High School. Um, and then uh, as, as usual, our elementary schools are gonna be celebrating their sixth graders as they are promoted to seventh grade, ending their seven year uh, run for most of them at, uh, at our elementary schools. And those are gonna happen on that same Wednesday, uh, but in the morning. So uh, that, that information is going out to the schools. The schools are uh, working to um, accommodate some special situations that, that exist um, with families and so forth. So uh, each, each of those is being communicated at their own school sites. Uh, next slide. Sandra, do you wanna say a few words about summer school? You know, there's some. Yep, absolutely. So uh, I believe last time we talked, I let you know that um, invitations, first round invitations have gone out. Um, and as of now, we are planning for about 20 students in each of our classes. And the first round of invitations were close to about 15 students across the board and second round invitations went out last Friday. So we were able to um, invite our kind of second group of students to summer school. And I believe also since we last talked, um, we were able to add an additional junior high um, rising seven, rising eight section to our program. So we're really excited that we were able to secure staffing for that additional section of supporting our students this summer. Great, thank you. Um, also recognize that I'll just um, mention it here. Uh, we are in the um, in the sunset, the closing week of, uh, of our standardized testing being administered. Um, as you recall, we are using testing other than the CASP testing. Um, but we are we are administering a, a mathematics and a language arts English language arts assessment um, to all third through eighth graders. So we hope to have some um, at least initial information on that in the coming weeks. Yes, Sandra, one of the two meetings coming up. Yes, absolutely. Just some high level before we dive into the greater detail um, in August, but some high level data for both ELA and math. And then um, the other item, we sent something out today. Um, the Santa Clara County is hosting a, a vaccination event at Los Altos High School tomorrow uh, for all uh, students, all people, 12 and over. So that's gonna be running all day, uh, no appointment necessary at Los Altos from, I think it's 10 to 5.30. Uh, we are also working with El Camino Hospital um, to see if they are, uh, they seemed interested. So we're working out some logistical details of hosting a similar event, um, um, partnering with El Camino Hospital, who has done such a fantastic job um, working with us during this pandemic. Um, we have testing available every other week um, at one of our school sites. And so we have been hugely appreciative of, of that partnership. Um, that is closing um, at our school sites. So uh, after June 1, that will not be happening out at the schools. Testing is still available for the community. Anyone who wants uh, uh, to uh, engage in a COVID test, but those are at El Camino Hospital. Um, and you can call and, and get an appointment for that. Uh, we will be advertising that. Uh, regarding next year, um, we are talking to El Camino uh, right now about what, what next year holds and um, whether they're going to uh, reestablish that testing availability. So stay tuned on that. Next slide. Um, just looking ahead, uh, Sandra mentioned summer school. Just a reminder that Covington is going to host our special education or ESY extended school year summer school. And our regular summer school will be at Santa Rita. Uh, Sandra, maybe a quick reminder about um, 
times or not times, but dates, window dates, because normally these coincide almost exactly, but not this year. Yep, our special education ESY at Covington will start the Monday after we get out. And isn't that horrible? I don't know the calendar date. And we'll go to July 5th or 6th, I believe. Uh, our regular ed program at Santa Rita will run from the 5th through the 30th of July. So we gave that buffer The ESY starts soon after school gets out and our regular ed program has a little buffer before uh, or after and before school begins and is running through July. All right, and of course we are um, working on next year and uh, just a, a restatement that we fully intend the, and expect that we will be back um, five days a week next year, looking like a uh, normal school year, uh, more like a normal school year than a um, than an unprecedented school year. So uh, we certainly are looking forward to that. Uh, of course, the guidelines have not been, uh, there have been no new guidelines or updated guidelines uh, sent out yet. Um, though there have been uh, indications, if you will, um, on what we, what we can expect. I think uh, the most recent one we got was uh, from the, Sandra talked to me this morning from the California Department of Education. Uh, they noticed that we have a virtual school uh, set up this year and they wanted to make sure we understood, it sounded like, that that would not be an option next year uh, for virtual school, but any student who had a reason for not attending would be have would have to be handled full, through independent study. So um, we're looking forward to getting full guidance on what uh, what the requirements are going to be uh, at our schools. Um, so pleased that we're back this year uh, because we're actually getting to uh, to practice that and and test drive that and understand what it means uh, for each of our campuses. So stay tuned on that. We will fill you in as soon as we know more. Uh, next slide. And we are happy to answer any questions um, you have uh, on this topic. Great. Um, thank you, Jeff and Sandra. Uh, board members, do any of you have clarifying questions? Vladimir. Um, yeah, this is for Sandra. Um, <clears throat> how many of our, our students or yeah, how many students were invited but decline to attend because those are students that you essentially think ought to attend, uh, but they have not uh, attended. Uh, I, uh, Vladimir, I don't know the ex exact answer to that right, right now, but I do see Laura Wiley, who is our, uh, our summer school principal. And if she, during public comment, has that at the ready, perhaps she can chime in with that. Otherwise, I'll get it to you. Any other questions? Steve? Steve? Um, I brought it up a couple of times, and now that we've heard from the state that virtual schools are not uh, anticipated on the agenda uh, for next year, plans or thoughts about who are currently in virtual school back into their schools before the school year, I think they're going to need time. And if we're just going to bring them in on the first day of school, anticipate diplomatic for school. Um, so I was wondering if there's any, any thought about anything we can do to bring them back on campus earlier, get back into that, that climate and of um, not viewing as a summer school, but maybe it's a earlier in the week, the week before a camp type thing, bring them in for a partial day to get used to what it, what it means to be back on school in classrooms again is something to think about. And I'm just going to raise it once again. I think it's yep. No, I appreciate that, Steve. That is on mm -hmm. our um, list of considerations as we're planning. We're just uh, we're just not there yet, but keep bringing it up. Any other questions, Brian? Actually, on that thread, our families are this our families who are still in virtual school through the end of this year. Have they already gotten official notification about their placement for next year? No, uh, no nobody has gotten that yet. Um, 
Uh, we haven't re received ironclad word on this. This is an example of what I was, uh, uh, the, what I shared there was an example of kind of us uh, reading the signals that are coming. Um, that has not been stated as fact yet, but we kind of read that when you get a call from the State Department telling us how to prepare, that's probably what's on the way. But we will, um, we will certainly make sure parents are aware of that once we have, um, uh, once we have that um, final information. And um, we also know though that, you know, 94% of our families who responded to the survey indicated that they were ready to come back and, and ready to be there in person. We do know we have a significant number of families who are still in virtual school that are there because they want the consistency for their child. It's not that they're afraid to come back. It's not that they have any trepidation. It's that they, they have figured this out and they want that consistency for their, for their child this year. Sure, I was just wondering, I mean, given the, some of the concern that we heard expressed early in the year from families that were trying to choose between virtual school and sort of remaining at their, uh, I can't remember how we phrased it, but their uh, school of zone, yeah, the school that they normally be zoned into. I just wonder if I were one of those families, I would want to sort of have some reassurance by the end of this school year that there is a place for my student. If the, now that we've, floated the idea that virtual school is almost certainly not going to exist. I, I think it would be good for us to offer reassurance to families as soon as we possibly can about where their student has a spot. Because okay. it's only a couple of months away. <laughs> Great. Any other questions? OK. Um, I only had one little comment, Jeff, about the vaccine event that we're doing with El Camino Hospital. Um, if we can make sure that it's somewhere that's easily accessible by public transportation or walking or biking for our kids, Egan comes to mind. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We will now take public comment on this agenda item. To do so, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Requests received after public comment begins will not be accepted. All right. Okay. So far, I see two hands up. Are there any additional requests to speak? Okay, great. So we've got Laura and Brittany for public comment. Thank you. Oh, each speaker will be given three minutes. Sorry. Our first speaker is Laura Wiley. Good evening, board members. I just wanted to go ahead and answer uh, the question about um, summer school enrollment. We have uh, sent out first round 168 invitations and we received 111 yeses and 41 noes. We're still tracking down 16 of those first rounds. Um, and then after round two, we were able to send out um, about 50 more invitations, including adding that second seventh, eighth class, which opened a whole nother 20 uh, spots for our seventh and eighth, rising seventh and eighth graders. So um, um, we're currently at 127 students confirmed for summer school and tracking down um, those um, maybes and not heard from yet on a daily basis, so yes. Great, thank you so much, Laura. No problem. Our next speaker is Brittany Stevens. Hi all, um, I just wanted to know if you anticipate we're going to have the same like instructional minutes or similar bell schedules in 21-22 if we can expect that for kids, because I know it's been, you know, early dismissal and things like that this year. So I, I happily don't need all three, all three minutes. Just wanted to know if someone could see into the future about that. Thank you. 
Thank you, Brittany. Um, Jeff, do you want to comment or should we move on? If you'd like to make a comment, I'm happy to comment. <laughs> yes? Sure. Yeah, I would, uh, I would expect the uh, schedule next year to look um, more like um, it did pre-pandemic in the in the before time um, than than it has in in these last couple of uh, uh, years year and a half. Um, so going back to the you know the the shortened Wednesday or I'm sorry the Thursday for um, collaboration time and the the um, regular length school day. So that's what I would expect. Great, thank you. Uh, board members. Thanks, Brittany. Would, would any board members like to provide comment on this agenda item? Uh, Vladimir. Um, Laura, thank you for or for those numbers. I, I I guess I didn't express myself very well. What I was actually asking was not so much the numbers themselves, but um, are we following up with the those who didn't? Uh, who either turned down or didn't respond <clears throat> because that seems to me that that's a group of kids who really do need the extra help and they're not going to get it. And so that's the, uh, what I was more after was how are we responding to that, uh, to those, to those families. Sandra, maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, I'll just say, uh, Vladimir, I, I will find that out specifically if we're tracking um, some reasoning around why they're unable to attend, if it's because they're not here or what have you. But I did want to let you know um, that we are working on what we're right now just calling an early identification system. So this helped us identify the students who would be eligible in rounds for summer school, but we're also working on looking at this spring data that's coming in right now, um, whether or not they need, they are a student who will need some intervention or some type of additional support right away once the school year begins. So if they're unable to attend summer school for a variety of reasons, and I just got a text message saying they're not asking for reasons why, um, but we will make sure that the classroom teacher and principal and staff know that this student is uh, below grade level in reading or needs some support in writing or in math, and we're identifying the student, the need, so we have a plan to start the year quickly. And Sandra, I think that it's also important to ask there what you just said that we, we do have plans in place for absolutely for addressing students who um, are not at grade level. Yep, summer school is just one piece of multiple pieces of how we plan to support teach, uh, students for next year. Thank you. Any other questions on this agenda item? Okay. I don't have any questions either. Thank you so much, Jeff and Sandra. Moving on, TK to five math curriculum adoption process. Mrs. McGonigal will present the curriculum adoption process, recommend, process recommendations, supports, and implementation plan for a TK through five math curriculum adoption. Sandra. Thank you, it is a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I am very excited. I'm going to close up my little side screen here. I'm very excited to come tonight and do uh, what I would say is a fairly thorough or an attempt at a very thorough presentation for you around um, a recommended math curriculum adoption. And we are going to go into some depth um, because I want to make sure that you have the information you need to make a decision um, next week when we come back. So next slide, Marcy. We're going to start with rationale. Um, and we're really going to start here. And part of this beginning portion of the slide deck is a bit of a history lesson about um, where we've been with our math teaching and learning in LASD for the last several years. And then um, we'll flow from there. So next slide, Marcy. And so why did we want to bring to you a recommendation for a new math adoption, I would say one of our biggest areas of concern within math has been around a lack of alignment. 
And we've heard this from families. We've heard this from teachers. We've heard this from our coaching staff, our instructional support teachers. Um, and prior to the pandemic, it had surfaced that we did have a lack of alignment or weak alignment around math instruction. And so school by school, teacher by teacher, grade by grade sometimes, um, students were getting a different math experience. And we know from our good work of professional learning communities that a guaranteed and viable base curriculum for all students is really critical and that uh, that base curriculum is what supports all students, um, but especially we know that students with greatest need without that aligned curriculum and similar experience are really the ones who are going to um, suffer the most from a lack of alignment. So you may remember, you've seen this graphic before, and when we talk about alignment in math or doing math, we want to and we will talk about these three different areas um, computational and procedural skills right do you know your math facts can you add can you multiply can you divide fractions um, that goes along with the idea of conceptual understanding is really do you understand why the math works why the algorithm or formula works the way it does and lastly, it's this area of problem solving, which is uh, being able to apply the math and knowing when to use the right math for the right problem. And in the center there, it says doing math that could also say rigor in math. And really, that is how math is defined as rigorous is does it have uh, solid experiences for students in each of those three areas? Um, so this was a question we looked at. Next slide, please. And you do know that um, Envision Math is our current adopted math curriculum, and we've had it for several years since I came into this district. Um, it was already our adopted curriculum, and then when um, we moved to Common Core State Standards, uh, that curriculum was updated to be Common Core aligned. Um, but because we had concerns or questions, I would say, around alignment in math for the last two years pre-pandemic, uh, the Curriculum Council actually engaged in a study around mathematics, and we looked closely at our Envision core curriculum to see what is working, what is not working, what do teachers have to say about this curriculum, and really what we found in the highlighted graphic there is it does a pretty decent job of the computational and procedural skills. Kids learn how to do do the math, uh, that portion of the math. But we also heard loud and clear from teachers who were spending lots of times time. Uh, to supplement those other two areas because what they had through Envision, they did not feel was rigorous enough. Um, so now you have this, uh, the beginning of a lack of alignment, right? We have a core curriculum that provides good uh, uh, experiences for students around the computational and procedural skills, but you have every teacher or teacher team or schools who are finding, creating, uh, buying their additional supplemental curriculum to fill in those other two um, areas. And this was a concern. So next slide. So we decided to pull together um, math cohorts. Our goal was to, we were for year one, we came to the board with this several years ago, but just to really look at, we started with K two and fourth grade teachers um, to really look at what does teaching and learning look like? What should it look like? What supplemental supports or materials do we need to round out our program? And what actually ended up happening is San Francisco Unified School District released their open source math curriculum. Um, and this, we'll talk a little bit more about the curriculum later, but uh, after a start with our math cohorts of teachers, they ended up um, piloting this curriculum because they had heard about it. A few of them had tried it. Um, again, that lack of alignment, right? We have some teachers diving into a wholly new curriculum. And so we pulled together our math cohorts and decided for these um, K2 and fourth grade teachers to meet 
on a monthly basis to go deep into looking at the design of these units to looking at the um, data that students were producing at the end of each units and and how students were performing with this curriculum in place of envision um, and what our teachers found is looking at the graphic it does an exceptional job of problem solving and computational understanding experiences for students it also does a good job of the um, computational and procedural skills, but some of our teachers still wanted to supplement in that particular area as well to make sure that um, students are getting that full, full rounded math, rigorous math experience. Um, but what they did report is that it was much easier to supplement the practice the, the practice skills, the uh, those types of things, as opposed to finding the rich math tasks and building conceptual understanding for students. So next slide. So then the pandemic hit, as we all remember, and we needed to, to respond. So we finished out last school year, teachers were still doing their, their own version of what their grade level math program looked like and working closely and working hard to build a comprehensive program for their students. But we knew starting this school year that we needed solid alignment. We had our plan for um, our learning plans. We had a plan for central support and training. Um, and so we really wanted to choose the best curriculum to as a response to the pandemic. Uh, what we heard loud and clear from our pilot teachers who had really gotten into the San Francisco curriculum. And as you know, things within our amazing school district, once one teacher loves something, it begins to grow. And even teachers outside of our cohorts had started using the curriculum. Not all teachers, certainly, but many teachers. And so we really looked at what is our best response. Uh, none of the teachers within the cohort wanted to align around Envision. Um, so we talked with our administrative team of principals, we talked with teachers, we certainly had a few, a small few teachers who wanted to stick with Envision, um, but we ultimately selected to move forward with the San Francisco curriculum. Um, but it's important to note that no curriculum is designed uh, for the, a pandemic learning experience, right? So the, the version of the San Francisco curriculum that families saw at home, that students experienced is actually uh, very different than what the designed curriculum experience for students is supposed to deliver. So our amazing IST team adapted the curriculum so we could support students and families at home on their at-home days or fully support support our virtual school students. Um, but, but I just want to be really clear that that experience for students was not the real and true San Francisco math experience. But that was our response at the time. Next slide. So here we are with another big question upon us. And you know, towards the middle of this year, we began to ask this question. We knew that this was our response to this year. We knew eventually that the pandemic is going to get under control and school is going to be going back to a more normal school experience. And so this question came up again. We have an adopted curriculum with Envision. We have many teachers now who um, had used San Francisco curriculum pre-pandemic. And now all of our teachers had been exposed to some version of the San Francisco curriculum during the pandemic. And so we had to, we're here really, um, and through Curriculum Council trying to ask this question again, because we know alignment is critical. It's good for professional development for teachers. It's good for student outcomes. It's good for all student outcomes. Um, and then another little wrench that came in because one of our um, members of our curriculum council said, well, why are we only looking at one curriculum? If, we're, if we wanna do a math adoption, like let's go far and wide and look and see what is the best curriculum available. And um, just this year, I believe January of this year, our state has put out a draft math framework so we have math standards, the common core standards for mathematics. Um, the framework really talks about 
how you teach math. It's the latest research. It uh, looks at the different progressions of math throughout the grade. So there is a new math framework that is in draft form right now. And I believe by the end of the school year or early next school year, it will likely be adopted by our state. And usually the cycle of adoptions, a framework comes out and a year or two later, all new curriculum comes out to adapt to that new framework. So it didn't seem wise to be making a, a choice outside of either Envision or the San Francisco curriculum at this time, knowing that at just a one, two, maybe three years down the road, all new curriculum is going to be available for us that will be aligned to this framework. Um, Again, this is a little history lesson to get us up to speed, but this big question that we brought to our curriculum council is, do we stick with our envision or do we want the board to formally adopt the San Francisco curriculum? Next slide. So I thought it would be helpful for you to get a sense of what the curriculum itself looks like. Um, and then we'll go into the other areas. So next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about our San Francisco curriculum. Um, it's important to note, and I think our teachers in the audience here, uh, it is a strong curriculum. I don't want the sense to be that this was like our best um, okay alternative. The San Francisco curriculum is incredibly well designed. It was actually designed in partnership with many of our local and not so local math experts from the Silicon Valley Math Initiative uh, to the Bay Area Math Project. All sorts of great experts worked with San Francisco to develop this um, comprehensive curriculum. And what we love about it is that it is incredibly engaging because students learn math very differently than how I learned math and perhaps how you learned math. So when we think about the curriculum that we want for students, I'm not going to read you that bottom area there, but that is really what we want and what our framework and what our expert researchers, researchers in math instruction say you want a curriculum to look like. Um, next slide. So if we get into the unit design itself, so each and every unit, every grade level has somewhere between maybe seven and 11 units of instruction. And so each unit, regardless of grade level from TK through fifth grade is built in this same way. Um, looking at the graphic down at the bottom, there are four tasks in green from entry task to a milestone task. In between each task, there is a lesson series, which might be seven to 10, five to 10 lessons that build throughout the course of this unit. And what is so great is the entry task uh, is a task where teachers learn that task is really not testing is the wrong, um, allows students to show whether or not they have the prerequisite math skills that they need to be successful in this unit. So from the get go, uh, teachers are going to learn which students have the prerequisite skills for this unit and which students might need some support to engage in this unit and some small group teaching to get going. And by the time they go through these multiple tasks, uh, and hit their milestone task, that's really allowing teachers to see, did you learn everything I wanted you to learn within this unit? So each of these units is designed around these four tasks with a uh, three different lesson series along the way. Next slide. If we look at a lesson, so that lesson series is a daily math lesson. So the lesson design is really impressive and critical. Uh, and it, again, regardless of grade level, follows a similar pattern. So every lesson begins with a math talk. And some of you have been on the board for a while, know we've had some teachers who've come and done math talks with you. Um, it's, you know, a, a problem or an image or a graphic or an equation might be presented and students work through single singularly try to come to multiple answers and responses and ways of thinking and it's very collaborative. Well, our teachers um, who've really engaged in math talks 
have spent time finding a math talk to do each day with their class when this curriculum actually has intentionally selected a math talk to go at this time within this unit to help support the unit. So each daily lesson begins with a math talk. After that math talk, um, the students work through a problem solving task and the teacher is really critical in this moment. Um, they launch this task and when a teacher launches a task, it is uh, really a, a quick an engaging opportunity for kids to get into the math. They go through a protocol and I'll show you example, an example of that in a moment, but the goal here is to make sure that students understand what the task is that they're being tasked with in today's math class. Then students work collaboratively and explore the task. They work through the task. They try to do it, they figure it out, they talk about it, they model it, they're drawing, they might be using manipulatives, they are attempting to solve this task collaboratively. While this is happening, our expert teachers are like combing the classroom. They are looking for student work. They're choosing what work they're going to talk about with the class. They're perhaps giving some questions or pointing something out. They really are, oftentimes we call this orchestrating a conversation. You are wanting to orchestrate what's happening uh, during this explore time. So when it's time to summarize and discuss, that you have models of student work that your classmates have just developed and that the teacher during this time is doing that directed teaching. When I went to school and learned math, my math teacher got up, they showed me how to do the math, we practiced the math together, and then there was independent math work time. This concept and what we know about how kids learn math is that they have to conceptualize it to understand it really flips that on its head. So the direct instruction comes at the end after they have tried to grapple and figure it out along the way and use and build upon their knowledge day by day throughout that unit. Uh, in our primary grades, part of that work also includes learning stations. So that could be games, that could be um, little manipulatives to build, it could be practicing your fluency facts, all sorts of little um, activities are included for our teachers in a station rotation model in our primary grade. Um, so after the day's task has been summarized and the great deep discussion has been had, um, students are then assigned spiraled homework. Spiraled means it comes back around, right? So students are practicing at home. Some of our primary folks do the spiraled homework in class, but they're practicing skills from previous units or from a couple of days ago. And that continues throughout the year. So we keep our skills fresh um, throughout each and every grade level. Um, and we can access those pieces. So that is what the comprehensive student experience looks like on a daily basis. Um, it's important to note that each of those pieces is really important. I would not say that you're doing the SF math curriculum if you choose not to do the math talk or you don't assign the spiraled homework or do the spiraled homework. It really is a package. And I know the biggest shift for our teachers and where a lot of our professional learning will, will come about is in that summarized portion, that orchestrating the conversation, because that is... Um, the conducting of the great math learning in every classroom. And so that's where our coaches are, are already um, talking about ways to support our teachers in, in developing those great summary and um, conversation skills class-wide. Next slide, Marcy. So along with the daily lessons and what have you, the curriculum comes with a lot of great supports for teachers and families. Uh, I'll start at, what would that be, nine o'clock and work my way backwards in time. So every single unit has a progression of mathematical ideas, which is really great. It shows in the center where this unit is starting, but it also tells us before in previous grades, 
what were those foundational skills that students studied previously that will support this unit and it also lets them know next year or in a future unit how this particular skill will grow because we know that math skills run on a progression right you need to learn how to recognize numbers before you can count numbers before you can multiply numbers they all move on a progression so each of our units uh, has that progression as a tool for our teachers. Down at the bottom there, they also have great universal supports. These support our students with disabilities or our English learners. Sometimes they have sentence frames, they have vocabulary you can be pre-teaching. Um, all of these little supports available for teachers to meet the diverse needs in their classroom. Um, moving to the right there, those diverse needs also include extensions for students who might be coming in with uh, some knowledge or more knowledge than their peers. So it often gives an example for teachers of how they can extend this particular lesson to students who are coming in with more. Um, you can see a, a sample of what some of the learning stations might look like. Those look to be games that students might play and there are all sorts of resources for teachers to print out or to um, gather their manipulatives for. And then finally in the background you see the family letter there. So each and every unit um, comes with a really great family letter. We got a lot of positive parent feedback around the family letter. It not only tells what this unit of instruction is about, but it actually tells the specific strategies that students will be learning within the unit. And it provides parents some suggestions or recommendations of how they can either support their child or engage their child in the same using uh, unit with the same vocabulary or what have you. And um, these family letters come to us already translated in Mandarin and Spanish, which is phenomenal. Really great for our community. Next slide, please. So I wanted to share with you some language supports. Um, math is, regardless of where you look, math is a, is a, a language um, and students need to be able to read. We know that reading works across content areas. So there are um, lots of language supports in place to help students, not only our English learners, but students who might have a hard time really discerning what's important when they're reading things about mathematics. So on the left here, this is um, one of the signature strategies and it is called a three reads protocol. So anytime, if you can imagine like a story problem or a word problem in mathematics, Every time one of these um, is presented to the class in the launch, remember that launch, explore, summarize, uh, teachers and the class go through this three read protocol, protocol. The teacher reads the task and asks students to identify what is this story about. And as a class, we chart, like what are the very big high level ideas? Then the second read, the whole class might read the prompt together. But the question that students are really focused on is what are the quantities and units that this problem is talking about or asking about? What are all the quantities and units within this problem? And so again, the teacher in the class chart those up on, um, on an anchor chart or a paper there. And then the teacher or the class might read the prompt for a third time and really ask, what is this question asking of us? What other questions might we have with this particular information that we have? So before students are put into working on the task, the teacher makes sure that every student in the class has an understanding of what the task is actually asking them, which is a great skill to develop and it starts in TK. Um, some of the other graphics that I put up here are from our fabulous teachers who sent me all sorts of great pictures. But um, you know, we do a lot of anchor charting in our English language arts curriculum and our teachers are just as great about doing some collective anchor charting in math with their students. 
It helps us make sure that students are getting the math vocabulary that they need, that there are visual representations, which we know all of these help all students, but especially our students who might be English learners or students with disabilities, that that visual that of a chart, you know, again, when I was learning math in school, the teacher might have had a math poster, but never referred to it. We didn't create it together. These are created as a class and oftentimes develop over the course of a week and get added to as our understanding grows as a class. So lots of language supports within the curriculum. Next slide. So process, uh, San Francisco math curriculum is not on the state adopted materials list but we have an opportunity to um, still adopt materials and the process just needs to include, you can see down there, we just need to make sure that they are aligned to our state standards and that the majority of participants in the review process are classroom teachers who work with the grade levels that we are adopting. Um, so I feel very confident that we followed the process and we'll go into details of the process. And I will just let you know that our English language arts curriculum was adopted in the same fashion as well. That was not on the state um, approved textbook list. Next slide, Marcy. So we'll go into some details around the process. Uh, this slide is uh, one I've used before, so uh, and it is very detailed. So back to November, December of 2020, when we started looking forward um, about whether or not we wanted to align around Envision or if we wanted to align around uh, San Francisco, we started consulting with our math cohort pilot teachers. Um, we then in January brought uh, curriculum council together and talk to them about math adoption process and what that looks like um, and laid that process out for them um, in fairly great detail. We then had a, a series of grade level meetings throughout February from TK through fifth grade to really get some broad teacher input, not just our math cohort teachers, but all teachers. Uh, what do we want to rally around for the coming school year? Um, in addition to that, uh, as so you know, the grade level with broad teacher input, it was, uh, if not unanimous, almost unanimous to uh, rally around the San Francisco curriculum. We then asked our pilot teachers who've had the experience of working with the curriculum pre-pandemic to use the, the um, uh, evaluation criteria. So they really looked at, is this curriculum aligned to state standards? Are there considerations in the curriculum for teaching our special populations of students, our English learners, our students with disabilities? Uh, to what degree is the curriculum engaging and rigorous for students? And in what ways does it support family engagement? So our pilot teachers looked at those pieces back in March. Um, our curriculum council then, we wanted to make sure that our parent um, representatives on the curriculum council also had an opportunity to look at both curriculums because our teachers are um, familiar with both. We wanted to make sure that our parents did it as well. So I selected um, the same units that I put together for the parent input um, process. I selected the same units from Envision so they could look at the same unit side by side between San Francisco and Envision, which was um, very insightful. Uh, and then a, a fairly consistent area of feedback, which we talked about is this idea that perhaps we do need some additional procedural practice, even with the San Francisco curriculum. So in March and April, we had our pilot teachers this year our first, third, and fifth grade teachers try out some different practice tools of how can we get students um, practicing on a common tool for some additional skills review. So that happened in March and April. Um, our curriculum council got updates in March on the teacher feedback. We heard from teachers. They heard from a lot of the teachers who piloted the material or have just been using the material. We released a parent portal 
throughout April, we had 51 parents, the most ever. So exciting. I think for our ELA curriculum, we had one parent review it. So 51 parents was terrific. Um, and that happened throughout April. And then in early May, we brought all of this information. We reviewed the parent input and um, finally made our rep uh, recommendation in early May. Next slide, Marcy. So just sharing a couple snapshots of teacher feedback. Um, our teachers overall are very supportive of moving forward with San Francisco, believing that it provides um, great benefit in that conceptual and problem solving area. And again, as I said, some of our teachers want to make sure that there is also an opportunity for some additional practice support. Next slide. Our parent feedback, like most things, um, it was mostly positive, but there was some critical feedback. I, I took a sample of each for you just to get a sense of um, what parents had to say about the curriculum that they reviewed. They had a chance to review a first, a third, and a fifth grade full um, curriculum uh, lesson plan with all the bells and whistles. Um, I'll let you read those. Next slide. But for some common themes for parents, so we had 51 respondents, as I said, about 20 parents, um, in addition to responding to the you know, radial button, to what degree does this do that? Uh, we had about 20 or so parents provide written comments in addition. So some of those common themes, um, parents want to make sure that we are differentiating for students. Uh, we have many families who supplement their own math education for their child. Um, and we had several suggestions of wanting to level math classes starting much earlier than sixth grade. Um, uh, several of our parents thought that the virtual version of the San Francisco math curriculum was less than ideal. Uh, a lot of our families with uh, primary age students talked about how much reading is involved in order for students to do the daily math. Um, they wanted they wanted questions around how would we use freckle which is a uh, pr practice tool and whether or not that was going to be consistent across schools because families are looking for some consistency um, and same with homework will the homework be required or suggested some of our families want more homework some of our families want no homework um, and but overall there was great support for the adoption and acknowledgement that uh, this particular curriculum as our families are seeing that it's leading to deeper thinking for their own children in math um, so it was mostly positive next slide marcy Uh, so we know going into this, there are some challenges. Math is a hot topic within our community. Um, and one of the challenges certainly has come about because of the pandemic. Um, they may have an uh, incomplete view of what the curriculum actually looks like based on their child's pandemic experience. So we know that that's a challenge. And the same could be true of our teachers because we certainly uh, want them not to do the San Francisco implementation like they saw it uh, throughout the pandemic. So that is a challenge. Um, we also know that the latest research and in math instruction might be at odds with some of our family's beliefs around what math, math education should look like. Um, some of our families who are heavy in the procedural and um, you know doing the skill building feel like that version of math education worked very well for them and it might be working well for their child. Um, and so something different that is more conceptual, more writing about mathematics uh, might be at odds a little bit. And then just, it is a challenge that we know of. There is not one curriculum that currently exists that we've seen that really has it all. But in the end, the being able to supplement the procedural practice um, will lead to, I truly believe, will lead to a better experience for all of our students. Next slide. 
uh, a little summary. Again, we've met with every grade level of teachers. They really want to align around San Francisco. Those who've implemented it as designed in person feel very confident about its efficacy. Uh, the parent input was mostly positive and we know as we need to do in every content area, we do need to be mindful about being able to differentiate curriculum for students um, in, in both sides of the spectrum. There are students who need additional supports and scaffolding and students who need extension and enrichment. Next slide. With all of that being said, am I here yet? Yes, the Curriculum Council uh, finally voted 16 to one in favor of recommending to the board that you adopt the San Francisco curriculum. There were 13 teachers on our panel and all 13 voted yes. There were four parents on our panel and three of them voted yes and one voted no. Um, next slide. And I just wanted you to get that level of detail. Um, the council also really wanted to make sure that we came to you with a comprehensive plan. So this does not lead to the same problem of teachers supplementing of their own accord and how can we uh, do our best to ensure alignment across schools and across grade levels. So I'll share with you, next slide, Marcy, our plan for doing that. And we're very excited about this. Um, so our recommendation to the board is to formally adopt the San Francisco curriculum. But I also want you to know that we are almost finished developing what we could call a supplemental toolkit. So we will be moving forward with a district-wide procedural practice tool. It is my cute little pig in the corner here. Um, Freckle Education makes a fantastic free online practice tool that we can assign to students that is engaging for students, that is uh, standards-based and appropriate and will allow students to get some additional practice that they may need. And it can move um, above or below where that grade level area is. So that's one of the pieces that we're going to be standardizing across of our across our schools. The other is really exciting and we're calling it a fluency toolkit and our some of our um, amazing math or our amazing instructional support teachers, our coaches are building out this toolkit that is honing in on key procedural skills at every grade level and building some tools for teachers and some additional assessments for them to use um, with their students. So next slide, Marcy, I'll show you a little bit about what that actually looks like. And so this is a, a sample for you, but down in the lower left, you can see almost like a running record for, for teachers, where is, um, Throughout my week, I might meet with each and every student in my class or half of my students each week and be able to do a quick assessment. So they're giving teachers some um, very quick and short formative checks that could take place in the form of an interview. It could be down in the lower right, a little quickie assessment that I give all of my students and I can keep track not only on how each and every student is doing, but what errors. So they've created a whole code system on this right-hand side here of what, what errors or what level of fluency are students building over time and some tools for teachers. If we notice that you're just at the beginning of building your fluency, here is what you need to do with this particular student to make sure that they continue working towards fluency in an expedient manner. So this is the toolkit that our teachers from TK through fifth grade will have to really address um, that, that piece. So we have all of our three areas, uh, three circles um, shaded blue and that we will be doing math. Next slide, Marcy. Uh, part of this, um, I talked a little bit earlier about the framework that is out. Part of this framework that is out and has been getting some interesting press depending on what news uh, feed you read, but there is a call within this framework to not accelerate students, to have students remain in their grade level math which means that students would not take algebra until ninth grade and geometry until 10th grade. Um, 
At this point in time, I don't see a need to come to our board and begin that discussion. Um, we've had great success with our students who accelerate when it's necessary for them to accelerate. And I wanted to make sure that you know, uh, we feel very confident that this curriculum is going to support our students probably better than what they've had because it will finally be aligned for junior high school math courses and into high school and beyond. Um, next year, we're moving back to our typical course pathways. We did a little pandemic version in seventh grade this year, but next year our seventh graders, um, incoming seventh graders will go into any three of our seventh grade math courses, our eighth graders will go into any three of our eighth grade courses. Um, but I just wanted to reassure you that we don't have um, an, an agenda right now to want to um, get rid of our accelerated math courses. Our students continue to do very well in high school um, and beyond. Next slide, Marcy. Next slide. So talking a little bit because this is a, a big implementation of a new curriculum, we wanted to make sure you knew we were prepared. We've developing plans. One more next slide, Marcy. <laughs> I don't want to badger you. Uh, thank you. Um, so we have been thinking about our different stakeholders, um, and I know one is not on here, but we have uh, been working with um, SVMI, the Silicon Valley Math Initiative. Uh, we are preparing some professional development for principals because we know that they are the instructional leaders at their school sites. Um, our coaches, our instructional support teachers have already begun preparing for how they are going to support teachers in the fall. Um, and then we have a series of opportunities for our TK5 teachers this summer and um, ongoing support once the school year begins. Uh, we also have our IST team working on parent ed because we know an informed parent um, is usually a happy parent, but we wanna make sure that our principals have like a principal coffee type of thing with one of the um, uh, overviews that our that our coaches are preparing so that they feel confident and our and our families feel informed about what's moving forward. Next slide. So tonight is a discussion night. I am happy to answer questions for you. Um, next week, we go through the more formal. There's a public hearing. I will not do this whole presentation again, <laughs> I promise. Uh, but next week, there is a public hearing um, for the public to make whatever comment they need to make. And then the board will take action. Um, and that will happen next week. But I am happy to answer any questions you have right now. Thank you. Sorry, that was long and thorough. No, that was wonderful. That was very detailed. Thank you, Sandra. Um, board members, do any of you have questions about the presentation? Okay. Um, Sandra, I just had a quick question. I was really impressed with the supports that they had for families. Um, there's a parent letter that you said is available in Spanish and Mandarin. Can we get it translated into other languages? Because I know we have a large... Yeah, we could certainly look at our uh, translation team that we have uh, who supports us in all sorts of endeavors. So if we work ahead of time, we can determine which languages, um, you know, usually it's our top four or so that we translate. Yes, we can work on that. And um, just a quick question, Vladimir. And then on the second to last slide, the professional learning. Uh, yep. Does SVMI come out and do that? Is that what it's wow. like? in parentheses, it says SVMI slash LASD. Yeah, there, uh, we are hoping in the summer that we will be able to bring teachers together. We'll, we're still waiting on the health and safety orders right now. They're working with our coaches virtually, but we are hoping in the summer for our launches that we can bring them out and they'll co-facilitate with our coaches um, to really launch into the first unit at every grade level. Um, so our teachers feel really confident to start the year strong in math. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Vladimir, did you have a... Um, yeah, first of all, congratulations. I think you won the all-time record for longest continual speech uh, at an LASD board meeting, but it was thank good. Um, on slide 27... <laughs> um, on slide 27, you talk about TK through five. What yep. about grade sixth grade? 
um, let's see what it is. Let me see. Uh, is that is that appropriate or six uh, to talk about sixth grade there? Well, so the way curriculum in throughout the state of California typically is arranged is in a K-5 or TK-5 and 6-8. So we have current adopted 6-8 math curriculum. We adopted that, oh, I want to say maybe six years ago or so. Um, and at this time, what we want to do is work with our 6-8 math teachers on some of the same practices that will move forward and flow forward into junior high. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Um, any other questions? Okay, great, thank you. Well, we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To do so, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Requests received after public comment begins will not be accepted. Alrighty. Okay, we have a, I'm just gonna give it a couple more seconds to see if there's any additional requests to speak. Any other requests to speak? Okay, great. Um, looks like we've got three speakers tonight. Each speaker will be given three minutes. Our first speaker is Stephanie Hine. Hi, this is uh, Matthew of the Matthew and Stephanie Hine. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was very thorough in describing the curriculum, but it did not hit the most important topic, which is does the San Francisco curriculum work? You said that San Francisco was good for outcomes, but that's not consistent with test results. San Francisco Unified is a low performing school district. We in fact moved out of San Francisco when we had our first child in part because its school district was notoriously bad. Um, after 22 kind of child years in LASD, um, we're, we're very focused on the math curriculum. The latest state accountability report for San Francisco, which was pre-pandemic, shows that just 50% of San Francisco USD students are proficient in math. That means, and I can do this math, half are not proficient. Um, LASD has 85% proficiency, and obviously we'd like that to be higher. But what, why would we emulate San Francisco? I mean, if anything, they should emulate Los Altos. Uh, it seems that it would be more logical to increase focus on those particular students that need more support, the 15%, of course, that are not proficient today, as opposed to adopting a curriculum from a failing school district. Um, you know, of all the school districts in the U.S. or even the world, modeling Los Altos after San Francisco um, is, seems a bit incomprehensible. Uh, so that is, that is my, uh, my question, is why would we pick San Francisco and and uh, is there not a better model for Los Altos? Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Wang. Hi. Um, wow, Sandra, that was really um, comprehensive and I like that pig. Um, I'm really impressed with the comprehensive curriculum in your presentation that um, goes beyond the SFSU curriculum itself and the thoroughness in the process of um, this work by the curriculum council. Uh, while I do like the explorative nature of the SFSU curriculum to engage young students in that, um, I am really glad to hear that you're working on a district um, supplemental component for procedures and skills. Um, seeing my third graders work um, the school year through his math packets um, doing distance learning and hybrid, I was starting to get concerned about how he would achieve automaticity in his math facts with this curriculum. So I'm glad that you are really looking at addressing that. Um, while I don't believe in homework for homework's sake, um, I do think we need to consider having math homework starting at a younger grade, younger age, and that would be beneficial to our students. 
now that I have a sixth grader, seeing the jump in the amount of math homework from fourth and fifth grade to sixth grade, um, it feels like he hasn't been properly prepared. Perhaps we can consider a similar approach to reading homework where teachers have reminded students to read 20 minutes a day ever since first grade. And that's when we entered the school district when my oldest was, oldest was in first grade and adopt a you know 20 math back problems a day in the younger grades or something to that effect. Um, and the goal is very specific to build fluency and automaticity in math facts and healthy homework habits to prepare them for the jump in sixth grade and beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amy. Our next speaker is Carrie Middleton. Hello, board and um, school district members. Uh, my name is Carrie Middleton. I'm currently a third grade teacher at Santa Rita, as well as a parent of two, of two kids at Santa Rita. I've been teaching at Santa Rita for 15 years and have been through about three different math curriculums. Um, I was on the math committee this year that did the pilot of this curriculum, as well as uh, was on the curriculum council in um, all the discussions that Sandra has presented tonight. I have to say wholeheartedly that this curriculum is my favorite out of all the ones that I've taught for a few different reasons. It definitely has the highest level of engagement that I've seen in any math curriculum with its inquiry-based questions, its hands-on opportunities, and its innovative structure as Sandra discussed with the launch, explore, and summarize. The, this structure um, promotes group work, it promotes productive strugg struggle, and it produces multiple strategies that students come up with and share with, with each other. Um, the summarize is a really important component where the teacher does some direct teaching and really solidifies that learning for the day. I have also found that this curriculum meets all student needs. It has the homework to spiral concepts to review for students who are struggling. It provides extension act, um, activities and prompts to take those learners who are ready to move on to the next level. It also has a lot of EL supports built in with sentence frames and visuals and hands-on learning. I believe that this curriculum has a level of rigor that our other curriculums have not possessed. Students have to evaluate math processes and strategies, and they do this via their math talks, which are open-ended um, math problems that foster discussion and making their thinking visible. You don't know a concept until you actually can explain it. Memorizing a single procedure or that drill and kill style is not conceptual understanding of mathematical skills. Um, this curriculum builds upon strategies where um, discussions come out where not just um, you know, doing it one way, but really having a conversation about what are all of the ways and getting to the quickest and most effective and efficient way. But it, this also allows for struggling learners to feel successful with their options of multiple strategies. I do think it's important to note in all fairness in evaluating this new curriculum that most parents only saw a virtual um, option and not the full implementation. So I look forward to be, being able to show parents that next year in hopes that the board will adopt this. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Carrie. All right, closing public comment. Um, Board members, would any of you like to provide comment on this agenda item? Steve? I'm just going to jump in. I was on the curriculum council. We went through this whole process. And I think um, the thing I liked about Sandra's presentation is she followed up on all the loose ends that we kept bringing up and making sure they tiled back, especially the supplemental material piece, which I was very concerned about personally. I'm glad to hear we come up with a way to address that and move that forward. Um, and are putting that out there. So we have a consistent way across district to, to supplement by grade level, which I think was really important uh, to round out the Sac Sac, uh, San Francisco curriculum. And for the speaker who brought up his concern about us adopting um, something from a school district that he had actually moved away from. I think what we're doing is actually doing what we do with all curriculum that we adopt is, is augment it to work in a way that we think is most effective for us and allows us to uh, be successful with all levels of kids coming in the door. So I, 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 having sat through the meetings, listened to what the concerns were, I think you've, you've addressed what the, the groups came up with really well. And I'm hoping we can feel comfortable moving forward with this. So thanks. 
Thanks, Steve. Any other comments? Vladimir? Uh, you're on mute, Vladimir. Thanks. Um, Sandra, could you, um, is it worthwhile exploring why that one parent voted no? The reasons why that one parent voted no, or is that a, an outlier that? Um, I believe uh, some of our concerns were around the lack of uh, supplemental practice. Okay. I don't want to speak for her. She may come to the next meeting and share her thoughts at the public hearing. Okay. Um, just a quick comment to the gentleman who talked about uh, concerns about adopting um, a, a curriculum from a, uh, uh, a failed uh, district. Um, there's, there's more, there are many reasons why um, an urban district might have um, um, issues in teaching that have nothing to do with curriculum. And so for me, it's not an issue that um, San Francisco that does not have very good test scores, um, that we're adopting that. I, for me, that's a non-issue. A non I don't, doesn't concern me. Thank you, Vladimir. Jessica? I wanted to reiterate uh, what Steve has said about uh, how wonderful your presentation was and how you really did pull every uh, string to make sure we knew every aspect of all the feedback you received. Um, I am confident that this is the right curriculum um, for our, our school district with the supplementation uh, that you're planning. So uh, thank you for that. And along the lines of what uh, Vladimir said, um, having to do with the fact that this is coming from San Francisco Unified, um, we also know that you and your team of teachers are math experts and they've looked at it and they, they've been on the ground teaching math with our kids and know what they need. And they have determined what this is best um, for them to get the conceptual understanding, um, the problem solving, and then supplement with the procedural. Um, so while I understand his comments, uh, it's a lot more complicated. So uh, thank you. And uh, I look forward to you know, the public hearing. That's, I guess it's next week. Yep. Um, any other comments or questions for Sandra? I don't have anything other than to reiterate um, my thanks for your incredibly detailed and well explained uh, presentation. So I feel very confident about why and how you came to the decision that you did. So thank you so much. Thank you. All right now, you can drink some water because you've been talking for a while. Okay, moving on to our next agenda item, summer facility projects. Mr. Kenyon will share proposed facility projects for summer 2021. Randy? Yes, <clears throat> this will be fairly brief. Uh, this is an information item. And um, you can move to the next slide, Marcy. Uh, we do this every spring. We bring to you a list of proposed facility um, projects during the summer. Some, some years we're adding facilities such as portables for either the district or the charter school for additional, for increased enrollment. That's not one of those. This is not one of those years. Uh, what I'm bringing forward is only repairs and improvements to existing facilities. And next and final slide, Marcy. So just a couple of comments about what we're proposing this summer. And again, this is uh, information, you can um, offer suggestions or different direction if you wish. Um, so what we, we have about $300,000 in deferred maintenance funding on an annual basis. Um, so we're kind of limited to what we can do. And so what we do is we, our <clears throat> facilities director goes through and identifies all the different needs at all the different sites in terms of facilities. And then we go through a prior prioritization process to determine what are the highest priorities and what fits within the approximate $300,000 uh, 
source of, of monies that we have to bring them forward um, for actual work during the summer. And this is what we've come up with this summer. I believe there's at least one, uh, one project at each site. We also look to make sure that we're you know, giving sites somewhat um, some equitable distribution of the, of, of the spending. Um, but these are the most critical projects, the ones that we need to get fixed in order to uh, avoid additional costs down the road or deal with um, you know, certain problems that we have right away, um, such as, for example, paving, we might have tripping, and, tripping hazards. Um, so we need to get those kind of things fixed. So uh, again, this is for your information. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer them. Thanks, Randy. Um, do any board members have questions for Randy? Oh, oh Vladimir. Um, Randy, uh, if I remember correctly, we had some issues with uh, electrical systems, uh, uh, solar panel systems at one of the schools. Has that all been taken care of? Uh, there was some vandalism, I believe. Um, so we we had some some van, uh, some vandalism that was a while back that we addressed. I'm not sure if you're also thinking about the the report that we got from the consultant where we were looking at Oak School and trying to figure out the energy usage. That was one thing, but okay. now that you mentioned the Oak School was another thing. Yeah. Now the 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 uh, the repairs. I seem to remember there was a fairly large repair there. But anyway, that's as, as long as you've taken that into consideration, that's fine. We have, that's been addressed already. Okay, thanks. Any other questions for Randy before I open it up to public comment? <clears throat> okay, we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To do so, members of the public should use the raised hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing a comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Requests received after public comment begins will not be accepted. Okay, let me just see if we have any, any requests to speak. Okay, so seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. Uh, board members, would anyone like to provide additional comment on this agenda item? No, nope. I have no comments either. Thank you so much, Randy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All righty. Oh, Randy, you're up again. Yep. Next agenda item, disclosure of proposed collective bargaining agreement with C CSEA. Staff will present the financial impact of the proposed collective bargaining agreement with the California School Employees Association, Chapter 103. Randy? Yes, before we can agree to any proposed negotiated settlements with our employee groups, there needs to be a public disclosure of the cost impacts of those negotiated settlements. And so tonight we're bringing to you the uh, disclosure on the costs of the tentative agreement that we have with our classified bargaining unit, CSEA, um, which is a 2% salary increase for next year, which would align them with all of our other employees who have previously agreed to a 2% current year and 2% next year. And CSEA has already agreed to the 2% current year, but hadn't yet negotiated the next year 2% increase. Um, at our next meeting um, would be the act would be the time that you would be able to take action on this tentative agreement. This is only for discussion tonight. Um, and it is a disclosure of the impact. So I'm going to turn it back to you if you have any questions. Thank you, Randy. <clears throat> any questions before we open up to public comment? Okay. We will now take public comment on this agenda item. To do so, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Requests received for after public comment begins will not be accepted. 
Yeah, let's see. Um, any requests to speak? Okay, I don't see any hands raised for public comments. Mm -hmm. Go ahead and close that. Uh, board members, anyone want to provide a comment on this agenda item? Nope. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Randy. <laughs> Yours are fast and easy. <laughs> All right, uh, next agenda item, revision to board bylaw 9320, meetings and notices. The board of trustees will consider revising board bylaw 9320 to change the majority of regular board meeting dates from the second and fourth Monday of each month to the first and third Monday of each month. Mr. Bear. Yes, um, hello again. So at the uh, last board meeting, the board indicated a, um, a want to move um, our board meetings from, as you said, the second and fourth to the first and third in order to uh, really avoid conflict with our uh, high school, public high school uh, board meeting schedule, which also has the second and fourth Mondays identified as their meeting dates. So uh, with that, we have two items brought to you. Um, they both need approval. Uh, the first is um, a copy of Board Bylaw 9320, uh, Meetings and Notices. And hopefully you uh, saw in this, um, in this bylaw on the first page, uh, BB9320A, under regular meetings, the second sentence uh, now, would, if, it, if approved, would now read, the majority of regular meetings shall be held at 7 p.m. on the first and third Mondays at the district office. So um, that's a change that's that needs to occur in order for the next item, uh, the actual change of dates for next year to be approved. So Shali, back to you for consideration of approval of the board bylaw change. Thank you, Jeff. Um, any questions, board members? Brian? Um, Jeff, the, the first section, the first sentence, sorry, in that paragraph, um, I just noticed this. It says she'll hold at least one regular meeting each month. Um, can we add except July to that mm. sentence just to square with our yep. current practice? Or we could add a meeting in July. <laughs> except July. All right. I added that at the end of that sentence. Great. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Okay, we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To do so, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Requests received after public comment begins will not be accepted. All right, we'll just give it a few seconds to see if there's any requests to speak. Okay, seeing none, I'm going to close public comment. Um, board members, any additional comments on this agenda item? I just want to say I'm grateful this is happening. I, I hope that in the future, the state changes the whole teleconferencing piece of this. Uh, you know, a lot of the times we change our board policy has to do with state laws. Teleconferencing, this is how it stands without the executive order. I hope that pieces of the executive order go into this. It's just more of a statement of perhaps if it doesn't, we start actually advocating for that in the future. It will allow for us to be engaged wherever we are as, as board members and without the having to be there 24 hours in advance to put up a piece of paper saying we're gonna be there. Anyway. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Any other comments? Okay. So may I please have a motion to approve the revision to board bylaw 9320 meetings and notices with the correction that we're going to add except July or some language to that effect. 
Would anyone like to make that motion? <laughs> so moved. <laughs> Vladimir, second? Seconded. Thank you, Jessica. Um, any further discussion? Okay, motion to revise board bylaw 9320, meeting the notices with the uh, addition of uh, except July, was made by Vladimir and seconded by Jessica. Roll call vote. Steve. Yes. Jessica? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Vladimir? Yes. I too vote yes. Motion passes unanimously. That's great. I'm so glad that we can accommodate our parents who are both LASD and MBLA parents, three of whom are on this board. <laughs> okay, moving along. The revised 2021-22 board meeting calendar. The board of trustees will consider approving the revised 2021-22 board meeting calendar to reflect the regular meeting date change to the first and third Monday of each month. Mr. Baer. Yes, hello again. Um, based on your action on H5, um, I bring to you a revised board meeting calendar for the 2021-22 school year, which incorporates the adjustments um, discussed at our last meeting. So bring that forward for your consideration and um, approval. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Any questions from the board for Jeff? Okay, we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To do so, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Requests received after public comment begins will not be accepted. Okay, just gonna give it a few seconds to see if anybody raises their hands. Okay, seeing no hands raised for public comment, I'll go ahead and close it. Okay, board members, any further comment on this agenda item? Nope. Okay, then may I please have a motion to approve the revised 2021-22 board meeting calendar? So moved. Thank you, Vladimir. May I have a second? Seconded. Thank you, Jessica. Any further board discussion? Great. Motion to approve the revised 2021-22 board meeting calendar was made by Vladimir and seconded by Jessica. Shall now take a vote. Steve? Yes. Jessica? Yes. Ryan? Yes. Vladimir? Yes. I too vote yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, uh, next agenda item, board policy updates. CSBA periodically advises districts of recommended changes in board policies, administrative regulations, and board bylaws as a means to assist boards in keeping their policies current and reflecting all recent changes in law and regulations. The Board of Trustees will review the updated wording for the following policies. I'll turn it over to you, Jeff. Yes, so um, bring before you for discussion only um, at this meeting, uh, we would bring them back for approval at a later meeting, typically the next meeting. Um, but there are a variety of uh, board policies, administrative regulations, um, board bylaws and exhibits um, brought forth um, for you to consider. And again, as Shali mentioned, uh, these, are, these all have um, updates due to uh, case law changing, new state regulations, um, executive orders, things like that, um, that require some change within each of these. Uh, I'm sure you saw in the attachments that there was a, um, uh, an explanation of the update uh, attached to each of the, of the proposed policy language changes. And just so uh, we, sure we're, we are sure we are um, talking about the same sets, we have BPAR 0460, um, which is Local Control and Accountability Plan, uh, Board Policy 1112, Media Relations, Board Policy 1431, Waivers, 
board policy 2121 superintendent's contract board policy and administrative regulation 4116 uh, regarding probationary and permanent status uh, administrative regulations 41177 and 43177 um, employment status reports uh, board policy 5123 promotion acceleration retention Administrative Regulation 5125, having to do with student records. Board Bylaw and Exhibit 9321, regarding closed sessions. And Board Bylaw 9323, regarding meeting conduct. So uh, again, bring those forward for uh, your consideration and review. And we'll take any comment and potential edits to those. Great, thank you, Jeff. Any questions from the board for Jeff? Jessica? Yeah, um, as it relates to uh, board bylaw 9323, that's the meeting conduct uh, one. Um, we have in here, it's in, I guess, paragraph five in after public participation. We have here, um, in general, individual speakers uh, will be allowed three minutes to address the board on each agenda or non-agenda item. And the board shall or will limit the total time for public input on each item to 20 minutes. We have never practiced this ever. <laughs> um, and I think um, because the census is after, we can, we're, we can do this in exceptional uh, circumstances and and we can uh, get approval, have the board president say it and we approve, we've never done any of this. So we either do this going forward or we strike this and we say we end it at non-agenda item and then strike uh, the whole exceptional circumstances because we will generally go over 20 minutes if there are speakers there. It's the time of them speaking that we we change uh, according to how many people are there. But I think this keeping this 20 minutes language that we haven't been following, I think it's, it's best that we just get rid of it. Okay, any other uh, comments? Vladimir. Um, I have some comments, but I'll wait until after public comment on, on the agenda item. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To do so, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Requests received after public comment begins will not be accepted. And let's just see. Okay, I see no hands raised for public comment. So we can go ahead and close that. Um, we'll open it up to board discussion. Vladimir, did you wanna? Oh uh, yeah, I agree with uh, Jessica's comments on the uh, 20 minute um, limitation there. We've never um, adhered to that. Um, I also personally have, I would personally prefer not to have a three minute limit on a uh, discussion uh, per item. Um, I think that uh, whatever we decide on for a particular meeting should be applied uniformly, but I, you know, I, I personally would not mind if one or two people spoke for five minutes each, uh, for example. Um, but that's, you know, um, something that would have to be discussed and, and arranged and, and put into words and stuff like that. So. I, I'm not, it might be worth a change, but then it might not. Um, <clears throat> I also have a little bit of a concern about the um, meetings that go past 10.30 PM. Uh, there, a board uh, motion is required for that, which is fine. Um, but then it, it, there's a notation in there, if I remember correctly, that says that um, we can only extend it once, but does not specify the amount of time that we can extend it. So in theory, you could extend it for like six hours and you know, uh, be covered there. Um, 
Um, are we discussing um, 9321 now, Jeff? Or are we just on the... Um... No, we're not yet. Okay, all right. I'll, uh, the well, rest of... oh, sorry, sorry, 9321, yes. Okay. Board um, bylaw 9321? <clears throat> yes, I think so. Yes. Um, <clears throat> um, there was some wor uh, wording there that talked about an open session preceding a closed session. And I think that's the reverse of what we normally do. We have closed sessions preceding open session. And maybe my, I misunderstood the, um, the particular section there, but um, whatever it is, I, I didn't, I thought there was a concern there. Um, I, I would like to see some sort of language in <clears throat> our bylaws that uh, strongly discourage personal comments um, during meetings or a, a, a public comment, not because people don't have the right to say that, but I think it's more effective if it's handled, at least initially, if it's handled on a one-to-one -one basis. I, I really don't want to sit around and, and listen to somebody badmouth somebody else. Um, if they have an issue, then I think there are, we have procedures to go through uh, to address it. And if those procedures don't result in a, a satisfactory outcome, then it's appropriate to, uh, to discuss it. But I, I, I would, otherwise I would strongly discourage personal comment. Um, there was also some discussion in there about um, the Brown Act. And it seemed to me that we were exempting ourselves from portions of the Brown Act. I'd, I can go back and look at the, the exact place. And I didn't know that that was possible. It's helpful to have the exact spot. Yeah, all right. I, I, I'll get it to you later. Okay. Um, the last thing, which I do have an exact spot for is uh, page nine, uh, paragraph five talks about uncles. And I don't think that's what you meant. I think you meant unless. <laughs> Say that again, Vladimir. Um, <clears throat> at least what I had was um, page nine, uh, number uh, paragraph number five has the word uncles in it. And I think you meant unless. I think somebody Not meant it. unless there. That's all. Thank you, Vladimir. Any other comments, Brian? Yeah, just the comment on the on the public comment time. I I think we should have some kind of limit to set the expectation. Um, I mean, although we do take public comment and it's valuable, these meetings are for us to do our business, not for the public to talk to us primarily, and so. Having seen things get out of hand with the city, I'm leery of setting too open an expectation. I actually think, um, I think the language in here isn't quite right in terms of three minutes versus two minutes versus one minute. I think that's kind of what the 20 minutes is getting at, is giving guidance to the board president so that board presidents will be generally consistent about when they decide between three minutes, two minutes, and one minute. Um, I'm certainly open to making it 30 minutes instead of 20 minutes. But I think it, I think there should be a general expectation limit in there that we're not going to sit. I'm certainly, I'm definitely opposed to the idea of removing a time limit for speakers and, and letting people speak for longer than three minutes generally, um, just because we have to get our business done and sometimes we have a lot to do. So I think that's my my comment there. I can send a suggestion, Jeff, if it's helpful. That'd be great. Um, I will do that. Any other comments? Okay. Oh, Vladimir. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just to clarify, uh, Brian, I, I wasn't suggesting that we just open it up. I just, um, there are times, not very many times, but there were a couple of times that I can remember where we did allow public comment uh, for longer than three minutes. Um, and that was at the discretion of the president and it was uniformly applied and it was not a general rule that we allowed everybody to comment, as many people to comment as uh, wanted to. Uh, the board president has always had the authority to 
uh, determine the exact length of an individual comment. Um, and I think that's fine. Um, I don't think a 30 minute limit, um, we've, we've run past that uh, on some occasions. Um, uh, so I would, I would not be in favor of, uh, of having that 30 minute limit. I think we just need some language that gives us flexibility so that we're not yeah, I agree. every time, you know? We'll get that. Okay. Um, any other, I don't have any other comments. Anybody else have any comments? No, great. Okay. Moving along to our final agenda item, board policy deletions. CSBA deletes board policies, administrative regulations, and board bylaws when either the policy language is added to a different policy or when a policy becomes irrelevant due to changes in law. The Board of Trustees will review the recommended deletions. Approval of the deletions will take place at the next regular meeting. Jeff? Yep, so we have one of each of those examples as you described. The first one, uh, BPAR 5118 around Open Enrollment Act transfers. Um, the, the law, um, the, the circumstances have changed and there is no longer an academic performance index for, with the purpose of developing um, that open enrollment list. Um, and then the second one, uh, uh, Board Bylaw 9321.1, uh, which was closed session action and reports that has been incorporated into 9321. So one is, uh, um, expiration because of change in law and the other is um, just been subsumed into another policy. Great, thank you. Um, any comments, questions for Jeff? Okay, we will now take public comment on this agenda item. To do so, members of the public should use the raise hand button if using the Zoom app or press star nine if using your phone. Your name will be announced when it is your turn to speak. Prior to providing your comment, please be sure your microphone is on. Requests received after public comment begins will not be accepted. And let's pull up our participant list. Mm -hmm. Any requests to speak? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna close public comment. Um, Board members, do, would any of you like to provide further comment on this agenda item? Okay, me neither. Moving along now, board and administration comments. This time is for the board and administration to report on non-agenda items such as committee reports, school activities, legislation, and future agendas. Uh, why don't we start with Randy? Um, both are Citizens Finance Committee and our Budget Review Committee are meeting later this week and will present their findings and recommendations to you at the next board meeting on June 1st. Thanks again. Thank you. Sandra? Um, I, this week I will be attending two more of our new teacher site share celebrations for those folks going through induction. It's the best time of year to hear about what our fabulous teachers have been up to. And then I might let Jessica do uh, the details, but I'm thrilled to let you know that Wednesday we have um, an RFEP celebration, a celebration for our students who have reclassified as English uh, proficient. Very exciting. Great. Thank you, Sandra. Jeff? I don't have anything additional this evening. Okay. Steve? Jessica? Hi, um, so I got a couple things. Uh, I got my 14 and 15 year old vaccinated. Uh, so thank you, science. So I'm excited about that. Um, I went to a um, education roundtable uh, done by Mark Berman's office virtually, um, where it's a hodgepodge of trustees and different people in the education space where he wanted to learn how things were going and how he can help us. So we all let him know how things were going. And this was fresh after the May revise documentation came out. And a lot of the basic aid districts said, oh, this sounds great, but we'd like this to be funded also. Do we get any money for this? 
no, no, we don't. Okay, well, that really needs to be explicitly laid out because everybody thinks, uh, oh, look, the governor put a lot of money in education, but actually we don't get really any of that money. Uh, so we, we pressed on him to A, get the money, B, help us communicate that we're not getting the money. <laughs> um, uh, so that uh, we can help manage our communications too. Um, and then uh, I went to the ELAC meeting this weekend um, at Del Medio, and that was uh, great to hear the different feedback from the families as to how our program has gone for them. Um, I think there, there was one woman I found to be very interesting where she was, when she had gone into a meeting and she has a translator, she goes, you know, a lot of the time they definitely translate exactly what I have to say, um, but they're not translating my emotions. And I, that really stuck with me because uh, we can translate all we want, but it doesn't necessarily always get the point across. I, I think we, that even happens just uh, in our email communications and stuff like that too. It doesn't always get the point across, uh, the feelings across. And as Sandra mentioned on Wednesday, we're having a, uh, the LASD ELL reclassification celebration um, at Egan at 5.30. Um, it's a drive up celebration where people will come in their cars, they can jump out for a minute to get their students certificate and a medal and a little special treat and a goodie bag um, and to get uh, pictures um, with administration uh, as a celebration. This is our you know, celebration 1.0. Uh, this is we're doing it for the first time. I hope we can do more um, in non-COVID and when we have more lead time to set up this party. Um, but I really look forward to celebrating uh, the achievement of we have uh, just under 40 uh, students that have been reclassified um, as uh, fluent English uh, students, um, and it's it's a it's an amazing accomplishment, and we, um, I'm glad we're, we're finally celebrating it. Um, Big thanks to you for championing, championing that, Jessica. No problem. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Uh, they deserve it. That's it for me. Thank you, Jessica. Brian? No, nothing for me. Vladimir? Um, yeah, so I noticed that uh, at the consent items, um, since I was voting no, um, that Jessica and Steve uh, took the lead in uh, making emotions. And that went so smoothly that I'd like to propose that <laughs> Jessica and Steve take over the duty that I had before um, and that I, wait, I can just relax during that period of time. Other than that, I don't have anything to say. You know, my eye goes directly to your square, Vladimir, when I ask who would like to make a motion. Now I've got to train my eyes to go to Steve. Um, I will pass. Have a, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Have a great evening, everybody. Have a good week. Thanks, Bye. all. Thanks. Bye. Uh -huh.